Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today I'm discussing an overview of the acute complications of cirrhosis. Those of you who regularly follow this channel may know that I've previously posted individual videos on the topics of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, hepatic encephalopathy, esophageal varices, and the hepatorenal syndrome, and you might wonder, what else is there to say about them? But this video is where I'll talk about why I chose those four specific conditions to highlight, how they share some pathophysiology, and ultimately, how they are associated with one another. Why these four conditions is the easiest of the questions to answer. These are the four major reasons patients with severe liver disease get admitted to the hospital. And they are also the four primary mechanisms of liver-specific death in these patients. While they were presented and discussed as separate conditions, they have overlapping pathophysiology, so let's take a closer look at that. Just as we have four acute complications, there are four particularly notable pathophysiologic consequences of liver disease. Liver disease, when severe, leads to decreased protein synthesis, portal hypertension, decreased metabolic function, and altered hemodynamics, meaning splanchnic vasodilation, leading to decreased peripheral vascular resistance, which usually leads to a compensatory increase in heart rate and cardiac output. Starting in the upper left, what effect does decreased protein synthesis have? Hypoalbuminemia contributes to the development of ascites, which places a patient at risk from SBP, and a decreased production of coagulation factors increases the risk of developing a GI bleed. Moving to portal hypertension, this also contributes to the development of ascites and by causing esophageal and gastric varices can lead to a GI hemorrhage. Decreased metabolic function of the liver includes the decreased conversion of ammonia to urea, which is hypothesized to be the primary cause of hepatic encephalopathy. Portal hypertension contributes to that problem since varices and other portosystemic shunts cause ammonia-rich blood from the intestines to bypass the liver altogether. Peripheral vasodilation leads to decreased effective circulating volume, triggering renal vasoconstriction with the end result of hepatorenal syndrome. And returning back to decreased protein synthesis, the associated hypoalbuminemia also contributes to the low effective circulating volume. I find it fascinating how all these pathophysiologic processes are interrelated and lead to a variety of distinct clinical conditions, but it gets even more interesting than that since these conditions can actually trigger one another. Consider that SBP can trigger the hepatorenal syndrome and hepatic encephalopathy. While the hepatorenal syndrome can itself trigger encephalopathy, and GI bleeds can trigger all three of the others. This phenomenon of one complication triggering a cascade of others is why any of these presentations are more dangerous than they might initially seem when viewed individually, and why I as a hospitalist get particularly worried when I hear a patient with advanced cirrhosis is being admitted to my team. They can seem perfectly stable and then out of the blue, experience rapidly progressive and catastrophic multi-organ failure. Obviously, this can happen to any chronically ill patient in the hospital, but anecdotally, it seems to happen more commonly with patients with severe liver disease. It's not hard to imagine why that might be the case. Anyway, this wraps up my small collection of videos on the acute complications of cirrhosis. If you like them, you may be interested in my video on the physical findings of cirrhosis as well as one on the interpretation of liver function tests.